Good afternoon and welcome to another InvestorIdeas.com podcast, looking at cannabis news, stocks to watch, as well as insight from thought leaders and experts. Today I'm going to be talking with Charlo Green, current host of The Weed Show and author of her soon-to-be-released book, Fuck It, A Guide to Letting Go and Living Free. Uh, we'll be discussing the cannabis market, the U.S. market, as well as some of her thoughts on Canada's cannabis industry, as well as her own personal story and what led her to write her book. So to start with, if you want to go through a bit of your background, as well as how you got involved in the industry, and a bit about why you're writing this book. Okay. Um, I started out in journalism, in broadcast journalism. I worked for a number of CBS affiliates um, before returning home to Anchorage, Alaska, um, to work for the station there. While there, I was assigned uh, the marijuana beat. Um, and I met the patients that marijuana prohibition was affecting. I met the people in the industry in places like Colorado and Washington State, and I saw the passion that was driving them um, to really trailblaze this new industry, this new landscape. When I went home and connected with the people that were forgotten about or being left behind um, or overlooked, and because of that, they were suffering. Um, I knew I had to do something, so I decided to become a cannabis activist. I created the Alaska Cannabis Club, um, a network of medical marijuana patients, to just help um, connect the people that had information um, that were searching for answers together. Um, that started to grow um, well beyond what I expected, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to continue being a journalist and also being um, a cannabis activist, so I decided to quit my job and use that moment to help push for marijuana legalization in Alaska. Um, so I, I said, fuck it, I quit, like on TV, it went viral, it's been viewed more than 100 million times, um, and it helped to, to galvanize the voters in Alaska. Um, around the time when I quit, we had only about 46% of the vote, and um, it was on a downward trend rapidly. But a few weeks after me quitting, um, we were able to pass the vote with 53% support of legalization. So after that, um, I went on to do a number of things in cannabis, but the state of Alaska decided that they would punish me for my activism, for my public statement. And so since um, legalization, I've been facing a trial that put me in prison for 54 years um, for legal weed, for creating the Alaska Cannabis Club. Yeah. So I'm releasing my book, Fuck It, I Can Let Him Go and Living Free, ahead of that um, in hopes of just sharing what I've experience the lessons I've learned from my triumphs, but mostly from my mistakes. Um, and so if I, if the outcome of my trial this October isn't favorable, um, then this is probably the last opportunity I have to try and do some good. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to do with my book and my story. Nice. Could you tell me, I guess, a little bit, is it just about, I guess, sort of your story and letting go, I guess, of that uh, sort of the corporate job world and more into something that you're passionate about and changing sort of your lifestyle? Or? Um, well, the story is part memoir and part guide to life. Instead of me just, like, venting <laughs> over 300 pages about different things in my life, I, I use different circumstances and different stories that I've lived through to, to show lessons. Um, so say for the first chapter, it's all about um, starting a goal and the most important step when you're doing that, which is being real with your, yourself about your current situation, about your circumstances, knowing exactly where you're starting. I say in my book that one of the mistakes I made as an activist was not stopping to really look into marijuana prohibition. I thought it was just about the plant. Um, when I quit, I had no clue what mass incarceration was. I had no clue what the new Jim Crow was, and I didn't factor in um, 
the fact that me, an African-American woman in a very Republican state, was um, challenging the status quo in a way that, that I wouldn't just be able to to move on afterward, especially because it was so loud and commanded so much attention. And that's partly why I'm looking at such an insane um, potential prison sentence and insane punishment for speaking my truth, for for fighting for what I believe in, for standing up and shouting from the rooftops about what I knew was right. So so that's what I'm doing in the book. Instead of it just being a memoir, it's it's also broken down into eighteen um rules for life. Yeah. So with hindsight I guess with you now sort of facing those charges and knowing what you do now, would you have done everything in the sort of the, the same way or would you have been even louder or I would have I still would have quit, but I I know that I would have immediately left Alaska afterward. Um yeah, I think that would have made all the difference. Me actually being there and within reach of the people that felt burned, I think that was a huge mistake. So in hindsight, um what I would change is is going ahead and making that statement, fighting for legalization and then allowing the the people of Alaska to decide what that would work out to be. But letting it to that point and and then leaving it to the people to to build on from there. With Canada legalizing, there's still a lot of talk going on about what's going to change in the U.S. as well um, with legalization. And even, I mean, it's take it at its face value, which isn't that much, but Trump has even mentioned uh, trying to federally decriminalize it and things like that. Do you think that that, you know, people like yourself and the many people who are, there's the mass incarceration and all those, very prevalent social issues. Do you think that it's going to get pushed in the next year or so where they're just going to have to federally decriminalize it at least so people aren't facing charges? Um, do I see legalization happening in the next couple of years? No, I, I don't see much change happening on the federal level. I think we're in a really unique situation where our president responds to the media and yeah. to what's hot and popping in the press. It's very troubling. But unless we have a group of really powerful celebrities, unless Kim Kardashian is willing to take up this issue and have another sit down with them, I don't see it happening. Unless the players that were kneeling use the opportunity that he's presenting and saying, well, if you're kneeling for this, then let's have a discussion. Unless the egos are set aside and people are willing to just sit down and talk about the real issues, then no. I don't see things happening, and I, I I just don't see those egos going anywhere soon. I think it's insane that I that none of the players have submitted any names to the president for him to to look into pardoning, for him to just look into the the matter of over prosecution and targeting of people of color. So um, I think it's it's unfortunate that the conversation on criminal justice is is being blocked by public egos um, and personal agendas. But hopefully, um, with more and more states going on board, with Canada deciding to gravely um, champion marijuana reform on a national level um, as one of the first first world countries to do so, I think that sets an incredible example. And if emotions and actual lives don't reach the the decision makers on those dollars and cents will. So once Canada starts shouting to the South about how much money it is that they're raking in and these different contracts and companies that um, that they're working with internationally, then I think that's what will get us there. But until then, is states, um, state by state, activists on a very local um, grassroots level that are pushing for legalization and um, and that's how it's going to be until we reach some sort of critical mass point. Not sure what it'll be. Yeah, I mean, of, of any of the people I've talked to as well, it's sort of the same question of what it's going to take for uh, cannabis to, I guess, join the sort of mainstream vice world. Uh, like, I find that one big thing that I want to ask you about, just because you sort of follow the cannabis industry pretty well, I know you have your weed show um, mm-hmm. where you follow it, and... 
uh, one thing that I've been noticing is that, like, there's a few, uh, Lowell Cigarettes just did, um, partnership with a marijuana company so they can basically, instead of, they'll basically have cigarette packs, but with joints, uh, once it's legalized in Canada. And so the cigarette companies and even some liquor companies are now looking at the cannabis market because they're already, like, they already have the, the sort of setup and the infrastructure to do this. To have a yeah. legalized drug, if you will. I mean, cigarettes, you can't argue that it is just a legalized drug that everyone sort of socially accepts to a certain degree. Same with alcohol, and they have a lot more adverse effects. So I just wonder, from your perspective, do you think that with Canada legalizing it, that, you know, what's it going to take maybe for weed to become the new social accepted drug? Hmm. I think a lot of that lies on how legalization is introduced um, and how the media decides to to help people interpret the new legal landscape. Uh, I think we underestimate the power of TV and of smartphones a lot, but um, but I think that's what is going to be necessary for us to really accept uh, marijuana just as much as we do um, alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, like you said, it's it's actually a beneficial plant, um, which can't necessarily be said about tobacco as far as, like, life and health and all that stuff is concerned. Um, but the reason why cigarettes were made so popular is because of how it was portrayed in movies and on TV. It was all of your favorite stars lighting up after sex or, or riding off into the sunset on that horse smoking um, smoking his life away, technically. But <laughs> all of that stuff considered, it was um, it was glamorized. So, yeah, I don't wonder. know if you see that. Yeah, so right I, now, I there are a lot of... Uh, there are a lot of celebrities and a lot of voices out there who are very, you know, I mean, you know, Snoop Dogg and Lily Nelson are the top tier, obviously, of people who have been endorsing smoking weed for their entire careers. And now yeah. that's legalized. I know Snoop Dogg even has um, his one company that he's involved in, and he has, like, one of the best trains that's out there or something like that. And it's, uh, it's just there is, I guess, I think enough culture that I think that I don't, I don't know if, I guess, from your perspective, do you think that cannabis could just overtake sort of that vice market that, you know, maybe in 10 years' time, everyone will be smoking weed more than they drink or smoke cigarettes because there's also the, as far as, you know, if you're teaching it in school, there's not as many downsides to smoking weed? Well, I do know in places that have legalized, um, they're seeing a shift, um, and it's something that you, it's, it's the numbers on paper. Once marijuana is legalized once it's acceptable for adults to consume without risk of losing their everything they've ever built. Um, people are shifting towards cannabis and away from alcohol. Um, I think it was this last winter or early this year that a city in Colorado um, outsold all alcohol sales uh, or marijuana outsold all alcohol sales in a month for the first time like in history ever. So um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, wouldn't you choose to to go with No, I think everyone would. Like that's what I mean. Exactly. Our little, uh, I guess it's because we're investor focused. That's our main thing, really. So, as far as the actual cannabis market and everything, are there any stocks that you've been eyeing, and which ones do you sort of keep your eye on, and why? Um, because I get a lot of questions during the week, so how they can get involved, how they can invest, I always tell them to look to the north, to look to Canada, the nation that's actually legalizing where they don't have to worry about the federal government coming in and just yeah, shutting everything down, arresting everyone. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, so I tell everyone to look to Canada, but I'm not going to try and, and front like I'm, I'm willing to or comfortable pointing someone in a specific direction when it comes to their money. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. That's, that's you. <laughs> that, that's why you're you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't try to point directly. We just try and, I don't know, inform people on what's happening in the market, roughly. So I guess just with your own situation and everything and, um, and obviously the, the trial and everything that's coming up, what, uh, 
I guess, do you think that that's going to, you're going to have enough support to sort of be able to deal with it no matter what, just because you have become such a, a, a voice of advocacy and of also the, like, you're a very, I don't know, not celebrity, but to an extent celebrity uh, status person who's going through the actual system of what can happen for persecution with marijuana. Do you think that you could be involved in sort of the tipping point for changing things? I hope so. I know that my situation isn't unique. I know there are thousands of people that are facing enormous amount of time or are serving enormous amount of time over a plant or because they're um, they're a person of color and that's just kind of how the justice system works. So while it really, really sucks going through it myself, I understand that I'm in a position with my platform to help draw attention to a really serious issue, this mass incarceration issue. So so um I hope to I hope whatever happens in my case will help um, will help maybe push the conversation. I know the conversation's been happening, but uh, what exactly are, are we seeing as far as progress or change? So I know there's the Meek Mill thing out there um, that's helping to draw a lot of attention to justice reform. Um, yeah, I hope to, to be, um, I hope to help push the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you do as well. Thank you. Was there anything you wanted to add or anything you felt you'd want to sort of discuss in regards to your book or anything like that? You asked about support. I can honestly say I've been really disappointed. Um, I expected to have more people with me. Um, I risked everything to fight for the people in my own hometown, my own community. And when it came down, for me to, to the time for me to appear in court, there was literally one person um, of the thousands of people that I personally met um, that have thanked me time and time again for for what um, for the work that I've done. So I've been disappointed at that. Um, I haven't had as much support in cannabis as I hoped. All of the normals and marijuana policy projects have been pretty much silent uh, for the last three, four years that I've been battling this and a lot of people expect these organizations to, like, a lot of people misassume in thinking that that's what these organizations exist for. Um, I was one of them up until I found myself in the situation and they were nowhere to be found. So to connect directly with supporters and rally as much support as possible, I'm going on tour with this book. I'll be in New York and Los Angeles and um, Phoenix and D.C. and Atlanta and a number of other places, and all that culminates with a three-day um, freedom retreat, 420-friendly freedom retreat in Coachella Valley in September. So um, if you're interested in connecting with me, if you want to hear more about my fight for my freedom, if you have any questions after you read the book, then I hope to connect with you in person in your city or yeah. at my retreat. And information is up at charlotgreen.com. If you subscribe to my list, I promise I'll only email you once a week, but that's where all of the updates will be coming through, on my website, charlotgreen.com, and my mailing list. Do you think that there is starting to be a change from, you know, the cannabis industry when it was first getting uh, legalized in the States and even when it was first getting mentioned in Canada, it was very much more like a fringe group of people. Like, they were people much more like yourself who were passionate, you know, quit their other jobs or, or made um, very strong decisions and made very passionate decisions about how they wanted to be involved in the industry. But now, have you seen the change from the sort of those people into maybe more the money people and more of a, of a sort of bureaucratic group of people coming into the industry? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think Washington State is a great example of that. The people that fought for legalization, um, that fought for years and years because of medical patients, that's the vehicle. Um, all of them are being or have been, in essence, priced out of the industry or legislated out of the industry. 
So there are the craft edible makers and the the people that own the smaller dispensaries. And unless you were able to keep up with the constant changing regulations in Washington State, um, there's no way for you to to keep what you have fought for. You know? Yeah. So um. Yeah, it's, it's crazy up there. I mean, it's not even legal for you to technically pass another person a joint. They've made um, just having cannabis events um, in themselves a federal or a felony crime, and this is all after legalization. So, so yeah, I think all of that is the people that see the dollar signs that didn't care about the industry before that. Um, they're getting in, and they see that, all of the people that existed before aren't as business savvy, um, are more activists than they are business minded. And they're taking advantage of that. And, um, and, and corporatizing. They're, um, yeah. That's yeah, a, I've noticed that that's a, that's a big conversation that's happening, uh, in Canada right now is any of the people that I know who are in dispensaries or actually working in the industry right now. Um, are very, I wouldn't say concerned, but very aware of the possible downsides of legalization for them personally, that a lot of their businesses are going to be priced out or bought out or that there won't be, uh, you know, there will be so many other bigger sort of fish that come in and sort of take over their area that a lot of that sort of craft, the people who really cared about it and started and fought for legalization will be priced mm-hmm. out like in Washington. There are upsides to regulation in that, you know, there's more control on the substances, there's more control on purity and on uh, the quality of the product once it's legalized and it's uh, and it does become sort of corporatized in a way, but then is that worth the, the losing of that sort of passion behind it? Right. Um, I don't know. I know here in – or places because my stance on legalization has – it's evolving, and I like as an, a real cannabis activist. I'm at a point where I don't know if I should actually continue pushing for legalization because the kind of legalization that's being passed is just wrong. It's just really shitty laws, and I know that they're designed to cut out these this type of people and and everyone that's been in existence beforehand. Um, so it's like, do you push for that or do you join the no people? Do you join the anti-legalization people? And so until we, as a cannabis community, are willing to do the work to get legalization right, because you only get to do it once, you know? And yeah. whatever you do is just how the industry is going to look like. They did it so long in Washington State, but they're doing it right in Oregon, um, the law we passed here in California is really, really shitty. Um, and the law we passed in Alaska is because I'm still looking at 54 years for legal weed, uh, years after we legalized fucking weed. So, I don't know. Um, you raise a really interesting question and I, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm leaning toward the no vote, um, for, <laughs> for no, me. That's if it's passing bad legalization, I'm, I'm going to probably use all of my energy toward defeating bad initiatives. Just, just, even if it just gives us a little pause to see one of us saying, no, I'm not with it, we need to do better, as opposed to just rushing into what we hope will work out, that's the activist mindset, not the business mindset of just hoping for a positive outcome. So, um... So yeah, it's a really interesting question. Yeah, I find it interesting because that's that's the sort of answer I've gotten from a lot of people, like I said, who are uh, who've been in the industry for you know more than a few months or something. They've actually been in it for years and and have been sort of advocating. Uh, yeah, um, you guys, all the activists in Canada, all of these stakeholders in the existing culture out there, which I love 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 canadian cannabis um it's just so dope i i I, i've been there um before they wouldn't let me back in they let me in and i got to experience like the hotbox cafe and stop at some sensories and just see what you guys 
have been building for so long. You guys got to fight. It's time for you guys to fight. You don't get a day off, not even a Sunday. Well, thank you so much for the interview and everything. And uh, I'll definitely be putting up an article about your book once I get that in the mail. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story and my fight with your platform and your listeners. So, once again, that was Charlo Green, current host of The Weed Show and author of her soon-to-be-released book, Bucket, A Guide to Letting Go and Living Free, which, again, we will be writing an article on later in the week. Uh, That's all for today's podcast. Podcast is now a certified word trademark on the blockchain through Cognate Incorporated CM certification. If you'd like to be a guest or sponsor on this podcast, please contact InvestorIdeas.com. And Investor Ideas reminds all listeners to read our disclaimers and disclosures on the InvestorIdeas.com website. And this podcast is not an endorsement to buy products or services or securities. Investors are reminded all investment involves risk and possible loss of investment.